This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showcasing exceptional films from all over the world. Get an entire month free right now by going to MUBI.com slash Entertain the Elk. You don't often see yellow in film. Compared to the other primary colors, red and blue, yellow is underrepresented. Which is strange, because yellow can be a bright, happy color, a symbol of optimism and hope. Just think of the yellow brick road from The Wizard of Oz. But more often than not, yellow usually carries a negative connotation. Film theorist Paul Coates suggests that yellow is more often associated with barren landscapes than warm, pleasant beaches. And it's easy to see why. Yellow is a warning. The color of caution on a stoplight. The color of toxic waste, disease, and urine. If someone or something is cast in a yellow glow, they look sickly. For this reason, many filmmakers shy away from using the color yellow in their films, but not David Fincher. Fincher is known for his distinctive color palettes, with worlds often drenched in greens and blues. He rarely uses conventional color grading, actively hating the way it can leave faces looking happy and healthy with this fictional pink hue. I, I think it sucks, and I think that the idea of like pink, healthy, happy people is fraudulent and <laughs> needs to be destroyed, so... <laughs> Fincher uses color as a storytelling device, and this is particularly evident in his 2007 film Zodiac. Zodiac recounts the real-life investigation of the Zodiac Killer, a serial killer who murdered several people around the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 60s. Following cartoonist Robert Graysmith, the film itself obsessively tracks the facts of the case and recreates crime scenes. To fully understand the character's interest in the case, the audience must be fully immersed within the world of the Zodiac Killer. This is, in part, achieved by creating an extremely detailed and accurate 1960s San Francisco, from the architecture, to the costumes, to the music. This is then manifested in the dominance of yellow within the world of Zodiac, recalling 1960s and 70s cinema aesthetics. Paul Coates suggests that the early 1970s vogue for yellow lighting in American films surely matched the period's sense of American society as polluted. This intense fixation on historical accuracy is not just for aesthetics. A key theme of Zodiac is the search for truth, as Avery, Graysmith, and Toski comb through police files and code ciphers, so too has Fincher and his team meticulously studied the Zodiac Killer to create a seemingly accurate version of the case. Since San Francisco had obviously changed in the decades since the murders took place, CGI was deployed to recreate locations lost in time. In his article, Deciphering the Indecipherable, Procedure as Art in Fincher's Zodiac, Mike Miley suggests that these effects are an attempt to reclaim reality from itself. Time marches on, but the film can reverse engineer the damages, and therefore hope to uncover the truth of the case. Beyond 1970s realism, the dominance of yellow in Zodiac serves another, more symbolic purpose. The yellow-centric color grading creates a murky, ambiguous atmosphere throughout the film. If yellow is associated with death and toxicity, then it's fitting that it becomes symbolic of the Zodiac Killer. Perhaps this is a natural connection, as the murders that connect both Toski and Graysmith directly to the case are associated with traditionally yellow vehicles. Toski investigates a murder around a taxi cab, and the Zodiac Killer targets a yellow school bus, indirectly threatening Graysmith's son. Yellow is a reoccurring motif during the on-screen murders. In the opening, victim Mike Majot wears a yellow sweatshirt. The murder of Paul Stein takes place in the aforementioned yellow taxi, and the Berryessa killings take place in a primarily yellow environment, the black-clad killer framed by the yellowing grass. The killer's presence is clearly felt within the offices of the Chronicle, where his letters arrive, and where both Graysmith and Avery work. Big yellow pillars loom in the background of conversations, showing how the Zodiac Killer is in the back of everyone's mind. The chairs of the meeting room, where the letters are discussed, are the same bright shade. This bright yellow links the Zodiac Killer's crime scenes to the locations of the investigative reporting. He may not be physically present, but he is keenly felt throughout the Chronicle. The character's clothes also indicate an interest or fixation with the Zodiac Killer. Yellow consistently crops up in the wardrobe of those currently investigating the case. Graysmith wears a blue and yellow checkered shirt as he begins to take a more active interest in the case. And Avery wears mustard yellow shirts and yellow cravats at the height of his interest. 
As he leaves the newspaper and the case due to his growing addiction and paranoia, Avery switches to a red dressing gown, yellow notably diminished. Yellow and the Zodiac Killer are intertwined, but as the film continues, Yellow becomes less a marker of the killer themselves and more of an obsession with the killer. After the four-year time jump, the Zodiac Killer has left the headlines and the public eye, the world moves on, and Yellow is no longer a dominant presence. The big yellow pillars of the Chronicle building turn to a bright shade of blue. Graysmith, however, is still dressed in yellow. His obsession has increased, swallowing him up until he stands out against the rest of his environment. He's at odds with the rest of the world around him because of his lingering interest in Zodiac Killer, an interest that consumes him and alienates him from the rest of his family. As Graysmith's obsession grows, he views much of his world through the lens of the Zodiac Killer. Potential suspects are framed within yellow surroundings. As Graysmith investigates Bob Vaughn's home, the location is marked by yellow walls and dark yellowish light, reducing the frame to a limited number of colors. This not only ramps up the tension, but also illustrates how Graysmith's paranoia and obsession colors his perception of his interactions. The proliferation of dark yellow during the encounter indicates not that Vaughn is the Zodiac Killer, but rather that Graysmith's obsession with the Zodiac Killer leads him to projecting his own paranoias onto potential suspects. This is complicated by the last appearance of main suspect Lee, who is seen by Graysmith in a hardware store wearing a yellow vest. Does this suggest confirmation that Lee is the Zodiac Killer? Or is this more projection by Graysmith, symbolic of his own obsessions rather than any sort of truth? Zodiac does not give a clear answer, and perhaps that's the point. There are no clear answers or definitive solutions. There is no undeniable truth that Lee is or isn't the Zodiac Killer. After the final time jump to 1991, Yellow is now basically removed from the entire frame. In the airport break room, the chairs are red, orange, green, blue, but not yellow. In the end, the only thing prominently yellow is the now published Zodiac book by Graysmith. Zodiac is a film about obsession and a search for the truth. It does not provide answers or satisfaction, but instead its search for truth reveals a deeper solution. There are no clear answers. Graysmith sought to find the answer to the question of the Zodiac Killer and instead found obsession. Miley states that in Zodiac, this need to impose or discover meaning in the world can lead to obsession, with the obsessed believing that fixating on the subject will reveal meaning. To abandon the obsession is to accept the presence of meaninglessness in the world. Within Zodiac, yellow symbolizes the Zodiac Killer and those connected to him. But as the film progresses and the world moves on, this symbolism becomes tenuous, instead representative of Graysmith's own obsession and need to find answers. In the last sequence with Graysmith, he sees a suspect in a yellow vest, but while you can find meaning in a yellow vest, you cannot find an answer. Not all directors know how to use color as effectively as David Fincher, but someone who does is legendary Japanese filmmaker Akira Kurosawa. These beautiful images are from his 1985 epic, Ran, which you can currently stream on MUBI. MUBI is a curated streaming service that houses beautiful, interesting, and incredible films from all over the world. Every day, MUBI premieres a new film. It might be from an iconic director like Kurosawa, Jodorowsky, or George A. Romero, or it could be from an emerging auteur that you haven't heard of yet. There's always something new to discover. With MUBI, every film is hand-selected, Think of it like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. MUBI is giving my viewers a 30-day free trial. So go to MUBI.com slash EntertainTheElk so you can see everything they have to offer at zero risk to your wallet. And start enjoying amazing films right now. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and share it with a friend. Thank you so much for your patience as I'm getting caught up on videos. I have two more videos coming out this month alone, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel. But not only that, but make sure you click the bell icon below. I'm gonna keep saying this, but YouTube is not sharing my videos with you. I've had so many comments recently of people saying, oh, I haven't seen your videos. Oh, I didn't know you had a new video. Oh, I missed this one. How come I didn't see this one? 
It's because YouTube isn't doing the subscriber model anymore. So even though there's over 300,000 of you subscribed to this channel, YouTube doesn't care. They're gonna share what they want with you. So reclaim what you watch on YouTube by clicking that icon below. It's the only way that you're guaranteed to be notified whenever I drop a new video. So take five seconds right now just to click the icon below. I'll, I'll wait so you don't miss anything. Okay, thank you. If you want to support Entertain the Elk and help me make more videos, feel free to check out my Patreon page where patrons get exclusive rewards like early releases, behind the scenes information. It's just a really nice way to help me make more videos. And if you like what I'm putting out, throwing a dollar per video or a few dollars a month really goes a long way. Like I said, I'm already hard at work on my next video, which should release in a few days. So keep your eyes peeled and I will see you all very soon.